Students, once again, welcome to another of our video slide presentation of the Humanities 232 class at Southwestern Christian College. I'm your instructor, Dr. Barry Graham. Once again, just a word of caution, this is an unedited video. There will be a few verbal errors, I'm sure, on my part. We want to look today at Chapter 16, entitled The 18th Century, From Rococo to Revolution. We want to get a broad overview by looking at the map here of 18th century Europe. You'll see that cities are growing. We have a number of cities, even over 200,000 people, which was huge for back then. But the main thing we want to note here is that while most of Europe continued to be ruled by the usual family monarchs, the ones that uh, were in power just simply because the father was king, so the son becomes king, or in some cases the daughter queen, the shift is starting to go towards more of a concern for the welfare of the ordinary citizen, so we will begin to see the birth of more democratic or constitutional republic types of societies. And so even though there is this concern for the welfare of the people, in order to keep power, many of these more liberal monarchs were, are often known as enlightened despots. And so we're going to see this eventual clash come into play both in the new countries like the United States and even in revolutions in France and in other parts of Europe. And so we see the idea of the divine right of kings, the idea that kings are in power because God has given them that in their interpretation of, of scriptures such as Romans chapter 13, versus the new democratic or constitutional republic type of ideal. To continue on that same type of thinking, we see an age of diversity here, unqualified optimism, but contrasting with that, extreme discontent. So those obviously contrast with each other. These are going on simultaneously. But there is this conscious engagement with social issues. And so we see both revolutionaries and conservatives even as we see those two today. I mentioned the enlightened despots uh, that are concerned with the welfare of the citizenry. But again, this was more in order to keep power. And the idea of duty and responsibility of the citizenry. This is reflected in many ways in the artistic style. We want to look first at the Rococo style. Many people don't like the Rococo style. Some people refer to it as Valentine candy box art. And it does engage in escapism. Some people have called it the anti-Baroque. has a great deal of frivolity, lightheartedness, art as entertainment just for the upper class, the, the rich class, the aristocracy. One of the ones that's uh, artists that's very prominent here is Jean Antoine Watteau. We see in his particular works such as the uh, Fete Galance and the Return from Cythera, these types of ideas show up in his particular paintings. We'll only look at one of them here, the Return from Cythera. Uh, this is based on an ancient Greek tradition claimed that the Isle of Cythera was the birthplace of uh, Aphrodite or Venus, as the Romans would say, the goddess of love. Thus, this island became very symbolic of ideal tender love. And so there's nostalgia, the, the idea of the farewell here, the engagement in sentimentality. It's conveyed by the colors, uh, by the light, the late afternoon light here that washes over the scene. And so the idea of the, the Valentine candy art is probably very evident. Notice that even though it's it's based on an ancient Greek idea, they are dressed in what would at that time been modern day clothing so that the people can relate to it. Francois Boucher was another artist who painted in the 
Rococo style, certain amount of eroticism, the emphasizing the ideal female form, which back then would have been much more voluptuous uh, in the style of Peter Paul Rubens, who we looked at earlier. This is evident in his Cupid a Captive, also in the works of Fragonard. We see it, uh, and, and of course he emphasizes the use of landscapes. Uh, this is always evident in paintings such as this that emphasize the emotional appeal because landscapes do evoke a certain amount of emotion in all of us. We see it in his work, The Love Letters. Here's the Cupid work that we talked about. Again, you see the voluptuous, more heavyset females that were considered more the, the ideal work. I know I've mentioned this before in previous works, but the idea of the very thin runway model is very, very recent in culture. We see it here in the Love Letters uh, painting of Fragonard. Again, the sentimentality, the almost overly sweet, saccharine type look. And this is why some people just simply don't care for this particular type of artwork. Uh, it's an acquired taste, one would imagine. Continuing in the Rococo style, we see people like uh, Carriera, uh, the pastel portraits, uh, the Anna Sophia uh, d'Este. We see the portraiture in the English nobility. We also see it in Rococo sculpture and in Rococo architecture, especially in the works of Balthazar Newman. We will look at a few of these works here. Here's the Anna Sophia. Again, you see the Rococo style, the very um, overly sweet saccharine look to it. It's also there in the particular types of architecture. This is the Pilgrim Church uh, there that was designed uh, by Newman. The interior does show the high altar here at the back of the church, uh, the oval altar in the middle of the church. Um, this is said to be known as the Mercy uh, Altar. And there were other artists that helped out on this as well uh, in some of these later works. Uh, the central location is characteristic of the pilgrimage churches in southern Germany and Austria, well known in those areas. And the oval ceiling, uh, Newman deliberately rejected the soaring straight lines of Gothic architecture and, and the balance of the uh, Renaissance style in favor of this Rococo style, the interweaving of the surfaces, the solid volumes, uh, and the uh, empty empty spaces there. He wanted to uh, emphasize those types of things. In contrast to this very, very overly sweet Rococo art, as we've mentioned earlier, the the tendency in art, in all types of art, is for the pendulum to always swing back, going from the emotional back to the more intellectual. And we see that in what's called neoclassical art. Uh, archaeology, the new science of archaeology, uh, gives an inspiration to this because as they're going back and discovering more and more of the Greek and Roman architecture, uh, even by digging it up, so to speak, uh, with archaeological finds, this results in a new awareness of classical art. And so they rediscover the Roman Republic. Uh, this has a great influence on the French Revolution that we mentioned earlier. And the foremost proponent of this was an artist by Jacques-Louis David. Uh, this was his expression of a very united op opposition to tyranny. We see that in his works, the austere poses, the orderly decoration. And uh, we see this also in the work of Sir Joshua Reynolds. So David and Reynolds are our two main players here. We'll quickly look at a couple of the works. Here's uh, David's The Oath of uh, Horati, and it's the story of Horati and three brothers who swore an oath to defend Rome, even at the cost of their lives, and uh, it's used here to extol patriotism. Um, it was painted only five years before the French Revolution, and David's works established the official style of revolutionary art. We also see it in David's depiction of the great ruler Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon, one of those that 
everybody has heard of. We see him rising up on the horse and the majestic pose. And he looks, again, these rulers always want to depict themselves as mighty warriors. A quick aside here, um, it's actually been shown now to be an historical myth that Napoleon was short. Um, a lot of people thought that maybe one of the reasons why he became a great ruler is he was sensitive about his height, and that was a way of of uh, impressing people. He could become this great ruler. But we now know that this was the result of a miscalculation between the way the French back then calculated length and the metric system and those kinds of things. He was probably about average height, which back then was shorter than average height today because we have better nutrition and things of that nature. So even if you go back to World War II, the average height uh, of a man was about five foot seven, and of course that's taller today. So Napoleon might have been five foot six, uh, maybe as tall as five foot seven. That would have been about average height, even if you go back only um, uh, even a few years ago in our own culture. Here finally is three ladies adorning a term of hymen. Uh, this was a particular work, as we looked at earlier, uh, by Sir Joshua Reynolds. We'll go back to him here for uh, a second or two. And uh, this depicts uh, some very Arist uh, some women of the aristocracy, of the ruling class, you can see. They're shown gathering flowers to decorate a statue of Hymen, uh, and he was the Roman god of marriage. Um, Reynolds posed them in what he described as a variety of, of graceful historical attitudes, and they were taken from the work of, uh, of the, the old master painters uh, that were greatly admired, uh, Nicholas Poussin and uh, some others. Uh, Reynolds intended this to ennoble his figures and to compliment them, obviously. And but it also opened him up to ch to charges of plagiarism, uh, which of course is something an artist doesn't want. And so that was controversial at the time. Uh, but this has seemed to have stood the test of time. And this is about halfway through this presentation, and so we're going to stop at this point. Let you catch your breath. And uh, we'll be back next time for Chapter 16, Part 2.